Hello. We will now begin our next presentation. We'd like to introduce Kevin Gauthier from Form Labs on the topic of from forming to injection molding, how hybrid workflows drive efficiency in additive manufacturing. Kevin is an application engineer at Form Labs. Before beginning his professional career, he was a founding member of Chambly Charter High School's US first robotics team. During college, Kevin competed in Formula SAE, taking overall top 20 positions in multiple competitions. He now acts as an alumni advisor for Kennesaw State University Motorsports. Experience in these academic engineering competition was Kevin's introduction to the world of digital fabrication through CAD, CAM, CNC, and 3D printing. Kevin began his career as an application specialist at Applied Software, a Platinum Partner Autodesk Value Added Reseller, conducting or conducted training, support, and pre-sales validation work with Autodesk 3D Systems and Artec products. In 2018, Kevin joined the Form Labs business development team, working primarily on validating users' ideas for manufacturing processes that include SLA printed components, writing the associated proposals, and enabling the user to scale up their production. Thank you, Kevin, for joining. If you don't mind sharing your screen as well. Great. Um, am I live now? You're live. I don't awesome. see your shared screen. Yet. What was that? I don't see your shared screen yet. Let me see this. Good. Um, I believe it's just your home screen. I don't see a presentation. Let me try that again. Third time's the charm, I think. Perfect. I will hop off now. Thank you, Kevin. Excellent. Thanks for the introduction. So that was a pretty in-depth introduction. Um, like she said, I am an application engineer at Forum Labs. Uh, in my spare time, I mentor a Formula SAE team. You can see some of us working on a composite intake manifold here with some students on the right. I also like to build electric vehicles and do 3D printing projects, both for fun and personal life, as well as my professional life. So a little uh, melding of, of uh, work and play there. Today, we're going to talk about additive um, workflows, hybrid additive workflows, using a 3D printer as an intermediate step or a 3D, 3D printed part as an intermediate step in a production process. And here's just a quick example to get your mind where we're going here. So you can see on the left a directly 3D printed part, um, actually directly 3D printed in our ceramic material, versus on the right a molded 3D printed part or a mold made out of a 3D printed part and then ceramic molded in that 3D printed mold. So that's a more hybrid workflow. So that's kind of the direction we're going to be talking today is where we're using these 3D printed parts as part of the production process um, for another, um, another type of part. So uh, the agenda for the day, we're going to talk about seven different sort of genres of these hybrid parts, uh, work holding, which is jigs and fixtures, masking, sheet metal forming, silicone molding, composite molding, injection molding, and metal casting. So to jump right in, we'll start with work holding. And for that, we'll use our friends at Ashley uh, Furniture, who use our printers for various different jigs and fixtures. And they experience their, or, and just to give you some background, we're going to go over their traditional um, process from start to finish on these jigs and fixtures. And that looks something like this map here, where a need is identified, a jig and a fixture, a jig or a fixture is designed, design for manufacture work is completed, quotes are sent out, uh, requests for quotes are sent out, and then units are actually ordered. After that step happens, a third party, an external vendor, actually produces these parts, ships them, then Ashley Furniture is able to deploy those parts. With a, uh, what once bringing 3D printers in house and starting this sort of additive uh, workflow, they were able to really flatten this to where they only need to identify these needs, design the fixtures, produce the units, and then deploy those units. And here we can see the one of the specific units we're going to talk about today. Um, this is a, a four-headed CNC routing machine. You can see the parts down here. They're actually these, uh, these pucks that are used to hold the planks of wood in place during the machining process. And they look something like this uh, close up. 
So when you compare the cost between um, outsourcing these parts and 3D printing them in-house, you can see some real benefits to making them themselves in-house. So they were outsourcing at about $10 per part with a minimum order quantity of 1,200 parts and a three to four week lead time. They were able to reduce their per part cost down to about $5.90 and they're able to produce uh, 16 parts using two printers in about half a day, 15 hours and 30 minutes. Here's another example of one of the fixtures they made or one of the tools they made. It actually goes on the front of a staple gun and allows them to line up their line of staples against an edge uh, really cleanly. This uh, adds to their quality and makes it easier for their, uh, their workforce to actually install these staples. So um, once, once um, 3D printing came into their facility, they were able to expand and do a lot more things than they would have done in the past um, now that they have this technology at their finger fingertips. And here you can see just uh, some of their bins with some of their um, unique fixtures in place. You'll notice there's different material colors in here. Um, those signify different materials they're using for different properties. And we'll talk a little bit about the materials that we have available, um, the most common ones for uh, jigs and fixtures in the next few slides. So we just launched a new material called Tough 2000. We launched this just a couple days ago. And this is our stiffest, um, st stiffest uh, engineering material. It simulates the strength of ABS uh, with minimal deflection. So this is a great material if you're trying to make um, a tool that's not gonna give. And if it does need to spring at all, it's gonna spring right back in place. Tough 1500 is a more pliable material. Uh, this is also one of our new materials. So Tough 1500 and Tough 2000 are um, an extension and a replacement for our older Tough V5 resin. If you're familiar with Formlabs resins, we branched them off into two new materials. Um, both are improved in basically every way, um, but we also went with a uh, two different models so we have one that's more pliable and springs and springy where the other one is more rigid so um, the more rigid one is the tough 2000 the more springy one is this tough 1500 and this simulates the strength and stiffness of polypropylene and then lastly an older resin if you're familiar with formlabs resins are durable resin uh, this is a gray resin for anything that needs to be abrasion resistant um, and really really pliable much more pliable than our tough 1500 material um, this is one of my more favorite resins to use whenever I'm doing two parts that need to move against each other. Um, these two resins don't, or this, these part, two print parts printed in this resin won't scratch each other up, which is uh, pretty unique in, in photopolymer resins and useful for any two things that are going to slide against each other. Now I'll talk about masking. So masking is used for surface preparation. This is for uh, masking off edges. Maybe you're going to do a process like a coating, um, like paint or powder coat, uh, abrasives like bead blasting, sand blasting, vapor honing or etching or plating or bonding. And you need to uh, mask off one area of the part so those coatings or those abrasives only hit one area but not another. Um, you can use masks for that. And typically, uh, typically those are done on materials like metal, glass, plastic, and composite to prep them for um, any of the processes you see above. So traditionally, these masks are made um, via taping. So a worker would actually lay down tape manually. Um, sometimes you'll see like at powder coating shops and things like that, you'll see off the shelf plugs that go, you know, into bearings or into holes or over um, pegs, that sort of thing. Um, you're limited to pretty simple shapes with off the shelf plugs. And then in high-end uh, like aerospace and automotive, you'll see custom-made molded parts that are used to conform to this geometry. So that's uh, sort of the, where the state of the masking market is now, but we're starting to see 3D printing used to um, make uh, more unique masks and make them more widely accepted and usable. So you'll see that some of the benefits there um, with, a, with a rigid mask, like a molded one or a 3D printed one, you can simply uh, install and remove it quickly in a manufacturing process. So it's not as labor intensive as doing like tape would be. With a 3D printed mask specifically, you can do really complicated shapes that aren't, aren't served by the off the shelf plugs. You don't have any tooling cost, um, and so you don't have any minimum order quantity when it comes to doing these 3D printed masks. So if you have one really unique job, you can make masks for it and not have to pay for um, tooling and amortize that tooling cost across all your parts. This makes it very scalable. 
most of the time you can use masks um, multiple times, especially if it's in like an abrasive bead blasting process. Uh, they survive that really well, so you can use them over and over again. And you can capture islands and other uh, geometry um, with, these, with these printed masks. And we're gonna look at some examples of that. So in the first mask, you'll see a pretty simple flat geometry, but you can see it's holding islands in place. So um, such as the center of the O or the center of the A or parts of the butterfly wing here, these little bridges actually hold those islands in place. And once you apply that to a part and sandblast it, you can see um, you don't need any, um, you, you don't need any uh, geometry actually holding those um, islands in place. Instead, they appear to float um, in your mask here. So you can see this is a piece of glass where the mask was applied and then it was hit with a sandblaster to uh, mask just the, the uh, Formlabs logo here. Another great thing about 3D printed masks is they can conform to any geometry. So here we can see a spherical mask uh, and how it conforms to a steel sphere. Moving on to sheet metal forming. So when, you, um, when you're prototyping uh, metal parts, sometimes you wanna make formed sheet metal parts or maybe you just need a low run of uh, sheet, a bent sheet metal piece. Um, you can make different uh, bending tools with, uh, with 3D printed parts. So here you can see uh, that this is actually gonna be a two-step process, but this part is the uh, end of like a sawzall where you'd see the blade slide through the slot uh, to cut. Um, and these two holes would be the pivot on the sawzall where you can actually change the angle a little bit. But this is gonna be a two-step process. So first we're folding the sides with this uh, really unique uh, rolling die. And then next the part is put into the second stage of the die that bevels the slot and rolls the uh, left and the right sides down. So we'll watch that one as well. And then the last slide here in, in um, sheet metal forming, you can see the three stages. So um, we've got that first stage that folded the wings over, the second stage that beveled the slot and folded the front and the back of the part down, and then some completed parts. Silicone molding, this is something that comes up really often and something I've done myself. So the example I'm about to show um, is pretty in-depth process of start to finish on silicone molding, and it's a part I made myself, so I hope you enjoy that. So first we'll start sort of with the anatomy of a 3D printed silicone mold. Here you can see um, the geometry we're making is these W ice cube molds, and you can see the three main sort of features that are done with the, with the printed mold. You've got your mold cavity itself, which is where you're gonna be casting the silicone into some draft angle on the walls of the part. This allows the part to demold um, easily. And then lastly, uh, something I like to do after doing a, quite a few of these is adding an air port on, uh, on the bottom of the mold. It does two things really. The first one is it allows you to use your air nozzle to pop the silicone part out of the mold and demold the silicone really easily. And the other thing it does is it allows this part to be printed um, directly on a sterilithography 3D printer's build platform um, without building up air pressure inside this pocket during the build process, um, which leads to rough surface quality. So it allows that air pressure to vent during the printing process. Uh, it gets you a much nicer part. So once the parts are printed, uh, they need to get prepped for silicone molding. So here you can see uh, applying mold release. This is a stoner rocket release, and it's a dry spray. So you just quickly uh, spray over your mold. Then you mix up your silicone. This is uh, the part A getting scraped out of the uh, out of the um, container into the into the mixing container. And I'd like to do this on a gram scale so I can get an accurate mix between the part A and part B. This leads to consistency batch to batch. It also leads to consistency in the color of the silicone, which you'll see the color comes in in the part B actually. So it's a ten to one mix, and here comes the part B. Then you need to mix the two, and the color really helps you do that because um, the you can see where where it's white that's not fully mixed. So once you've got it fully mixed, it's uh, consistent color all the way through it and really homogeneous looking. So I like to use a drill for that. Uh, unfortunately, when you mix something like this, uh, you introduce a lot of air pockets into the material. So you need to get the those air pockets out of the silicone. 
And you do that with a vacuum degassing chamber. So you can see here, um, the resin is now put into a vacuum degas, vacuum's pulled onto it. It expands as all the air comes out and then it collapses back down. And that's when you know that you've got the air out of it. Once you do that, you pour the silicone into your molds. So you can see the casting process here. I've got the air ports uh, capped off, obviously, and the silicone is being poured in. And then I like to do a final degas where I put the molds back in the vacuum chamber and pull vacuum again. This makes sure the silicone is contoured into all your nooks and crannies and your crevices and any air you've introduced during the casting process is then evacuated. And lastly, you let these cure. This was a 16 hour cure for this specific silicone that varies depending on the silicone. But um, once that's complete, you can enjoy your um, ice cube and your um, and your favorite drink here in, uh, in, uh, in your glass on your countertop. So this is a, this was, it was an ice cube mold in the end. Another unique uh, use for silicone molding is in audiology, but overall in this genre of sacrificial molding. So you saw in the previous example I just gave of my part, uh, you could actually cast as many of those silicone molds as you wanted um, using that printed pattern. With this process, the mold's actually sacrificial, but it allows you to produce complicated geometry. So you're able to actually um, print, a, print a hollow cavity, fill it, injection mold it basically with silicone, um, and then once it's cured, you actually break the uh, break the eggshell, we call it, off the part and produce a part with you know complex geometry on all sides instead of like a cast um, cast mold like you saw in the um, previous slides. Moving on to composite molding, this is something that I do quite often, especially my work with um, with the Formel SAE students. They need quite a few bespoke carbon fiber parts for their race cars, um, so I help a lot with that. And basically there's two, uh, two workflows that we're gonna talk about today. And both of these uh, are with a professional racing team, a Pirelli World Challenge team um, called Panos and Delta Wing Manufacturing who build a bespoke racing car called the Avizano. So you'll see two different, uh, basically airflow manifolds that we made with, uh, with Panos using these two different workflows. The first one being a traditional process where you print a pattern and then cast a mold in that pattern and then do a composite layout process. And the second one is a little bit more unique. We'll get to it when we get there. So first the pattern is designed. Some unique features of the pattern is uh, it's got a drain hole for um, the, during the printing process. Again, just like I mentioned on the silicone mold, this allows you to vent that air pressure during the printing process. And then it's got some geometry used to keep the foot of the part level uh, when you cast the resin inside of it. So you'll see why that makes sense in a second. Here's the uh, end result after printing the part out on form three. And then here you can see the um, casted mold that was made from the pattern that was printed. And the print quality was actually so smooth that Panos was able to um, pull the part right off the machine, wash, cure it, and then cast right at it without even having to sand it. Then the composite layup process begins. So you can see uh, pre-preg composite material being laid onto the mold. The part's then vacuum bagged. This pulls the composite material against the mold tightly. It makes sure there's no gaps between the composite and the mold. It also squeezes out any excess resin um, through, the, uh, uh, through the peel ply into this absorbency cloth here, which is this white material. This uh, absorbs any excess resin. And that means you get the like lightest, strongest part possible because your strengths in the composite, not necessarily, or your strengths in the in the uh, fibers, not necessarily in the uh, resin. So getting all the excess resin out is important. And then lastly, the part is cured in an autoclave, then uh, demolded from the mold and trimmed to shape. So you can see the final final part here um, on the bottom right. And then it's assembled on the Avzano uh, race car. So this was a rear uh, quarter window exit duct. In Pirelli World Challenge, they were allowed to open their rear window up to about, I think it was three quarters of an inch. Um, so this was a solution that they came up with as an area to vent this air um, out the back of the car. Now the second uh, workflow we're gonna talk about is directly 3D printing molds. 
This is uh, removes a few steps from the process I just walked through. Some of the unique advantages of directly 3D printing molds. This is good for a low volume because you're taking out steps. Um, you're taking out the casting of the mold and the printing of the pattern. It's also good for if you need to make uh, bespoke parts or mass customized composite parts because you're going directly from the print uh, to a finished mold that's ready to lay up on uh, without the intermediate steps. So you're able to uh, mass produce things. And this could be especially useful in custom orthotics. I think I saw Brent in here earlier. I follow his work on LinkedIn. Absolutely incredible stuff. Um, this would able, allow you know, somebody like that to actually produce composite parts um, that are bespoke. So designing the mold for 3D printing, 3D printing the mold, and then beginning the layout process like you saw before. And we'll take a look at that. So here's the uh, final composite part uh, on the left and then the 3D printed mold in our high temperature resin on the right. The mold was larger than the Form 3's build volume, so we were actually able to split this mold up into multiple parts. Um, this part uh, was supposed to be bonded together anyway, so it's really uh, two halves of a mold, but four parts in total assembled to make a two-part mold, if that makes sense. The parts are then cured in an autoclave. Uh, we've tested the high temperature resin up to 260 degrees Fahrenheit in the pressure of an autoclave. And you'll see why that's important because cure time of uh, epoxies are um, dependent on temperature. So this is a 10 hour cure at 100 degrees Fahrenheit or a one hour cure at 260 degrees Fahrenheit. Here you can see the part after it comes out of the autoclave. Um, Panos needed six of these parts, or six of each half, so um, yeah, six of each half. So you, we tested it uh, to that number, and we got parts, and the mold stayed in great shape the entire time without any degradation to the quality of the mold. Um, so we think we could go much further than that. They only needed to make six, so that's how many we made. Here you can see the part after demolding. And I show this picture a lot of times, and people are asking me like, what this line is. This is actually a line from a Kapton tape that was applied to the mold. You can actually see another one here and one down in this corner over here where it overlaps a little bit. But that Kapton tape allows them to um, take that take a piece of Kapton tape off and replace it if the mold ever gets damaged. Um, wasn't really a problem in this in this part at all. And here you can see the two halves of the um, shells bonded together to make the rest of this duct here. Um, so that's the uh, outside of the part, and then this is the inside part, which is the tool surface. And just a recap of what that part looks like again. And now we'll move on to injection molding. So uh, injection molding is a process where you uh, make a mold and then you inject plastic into it to create um, parts. It's really common in mass produced parts, but oftentimes you'll find that companies that make injection molded parts need to test their final parts before they want, or they would like to test their final parts before they tool up. Um, and sometimes 3D printed tools are an option that allow them to do that. Um, you might ask, why don't you just make a 3D printed part to test with? And the answer to that is, you know, a lot of times they do, but sometimes they need their actual material for testing, especially when it comes to, um, you know, testing for the environment or for weather or for cyclic loading. They need to see what the part's going to come out like in its actual manufactured form in material and process. So uh, this is a part that I actually designed for an electric motorcycle. It's a charge cap cover. Before it had just kind of a dinky rubber plug here that always fell out and your knee would hit and knock it off. Um, so I wanted to flip the direction it spun um, and I wanted to make it spring loaded so it closed every time and stayed closed. So this is a, uh, a little piece I designed and injection molded and we'll go through some of my learnings from doing that project. So here's the uh, sort of anatomy of the part. It's got two bodies, the blue one and the red one. The blue one is the mount and the red one is the actual cap itself. Both of those pieces are going to be injection molded. Um, it's got a dowel pin for a pivot and a spring that spring loads it and closes it. So that's kind of the overall anatomy. This is what the mold looks like. So um, there's an aluminum inlet. This takes the temperature of the injection molding nozzle so it doesn't actually um, try to burn or melt the 3D printed mold. So that's an insert that I made. And then you can see the mold cavity here that produces the part, the gate where the uh, plastic is actually injected into the part, two ejector pins for getting the part out um, if it gets stuck, and then alignment pins and holes 
that align the two halves of the mold together. Um, here you can see the mold in the injection molding machine. So uh, you, once you make one of these printed molds, you can see a little bit of the mold down here at the bottom actually once it was printed. But once you uh, make the mold, you need to tune the machine to make it ready for uh, injection molding. So the modifiable parameters on this machine that I was using are the pellet feed volume. That's how much plastic is actually moved from the feeder into the cylinder each cycle. The temperature of the cylinder, temperature of the nozzle, um, both of those are dependent on the material you're using, the injection pressure and the injection time. Injection pressure and time are probably the two most critical to get right, um, or the most time consuming to get it right at least. These pretty much come from the material itself. And this one, you know, the pellet feed, you know from how much volume your part is. So really the last two are the more difficult ones to get. Um, takes a little try and error, trial and error, but injection pressure, you're essentially trying to make it so the machine is pushing uh, plastic pressure, pl plastic, a pressure of plastic into your mold at a pressure that fills the mold, but doesn't um, try to squeeze plastic out of the like uh, split line of the mold. So you basically slowly increase pressure until you're not, uh, until you're fully filling, but not squeezing plastic out of the mold. Uh, this is really defined by how much pressure the mold can uh, hold. And then the injection time, this is important for cooling because you want to leave pressure on the mold during the cooling cycle. Um, this keeps the part from getting wavy. And uh, in this case, this part was a two minute injection cycle. Um, and you can see, uh, see how the machine's working here. It comes down, squirts the plastic in, waits two minutes uh, with pressure on it, and then ejects the mold. And finally, you're gonna actually produce your injection molded parts. So you can see what those look like here in this image. And if you remember back to the first one, it's mounted to the side of that electric motorcycle's battery. So this is a view from the other side. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, metal casting, um, which is a process of actually printing a part and then um, either molding straight into it or doing an investment casting process. So we're gonna talk about two different options. If you're using a, a material with a low melting temperature like pewter, you can actually cast that directly into our high temperature resin. So that's what you can see here. And this is useful for making like uh, figurines or sculptures or uh, tabletop gaming uh, figures, that sort of thing. Anything that can be made out of like a low temperature material, like a uh, low melting temperature material like pewter. Here's another example um, where a, a desktop gaming character was actually um, thickened out in a mesh mixer uh, where a negative cavity was then like a balloon, balloon split out of the uh, out exterior and interior to create a negative cavity for casting pewter. You can see sprues that allow the uh, um, air pressure to vent during the, uh, the casting process. But if you wanna do something larger, um, medium to large size uh, parts, you can actually do an investment casting process where you start with one of our standard resins, something like clear or gray, shell that model out so it's got a really thin wall, and then print it, uh, print it with the internal supports turned on so it actually supports itself. So you can see this is really, really thin, um, and these little dots are showing you where supports are inside of it, uh, but that's actually holding that geometry up during the printing process. And here you can see one of these really thin wall parts in the build volume. And if you split through it some, you can see those internal supports I was mentioning supporting the inside of the part. This gives you like a really lightweight, hollow, low material consumption um, pattern for using in your investment casting process. And since it's low volume, it burns out easier, quicker, cleaner, and it doesn't have as much CTE that's trying to um, crack your investment. So it's a good idea to shell these parts out if you're doing investment casting. And here's the resulting parts after casting. Um, pretty awesome. And then lastly, an aluminum part um, done with a sand casting process as well. So with that, I'd like to open it up for a q and A. I I know we talked about a lot of different topics, so hopefully we've got a lot of variety in questions, and I look forward to, look forward to answering those. Hello. All right, we have a few questions in Q&A. Um, the first one from Pranav, are the parts printed bubble-free by Form Labs printer? 
very bubble free. They're uh, all the way through isotropic um, and very, very bubble free. So we do that. We accomplish that a couple of different ways. We control the viscosity of the resin inside of the printers with uh, with heat. So we've got um, you know temperature control of the liquid uh, during the entire process. And then we also um, wipe the uh, bottom of the resin tank every time to clear any debris. Um, so those work together to keep uh, keep all the bubbles out of the parts. Uh, they're really really solid with with no uh, defects in them typically. If uh, if you do develop like porosity, yeah, I, I've never really seen bubbles, but if you de develop any sort of like rough surface quality or porosity, um, there's something else going on because that's not typically how they go. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question. In the first example where there was a cost comparison, does the cost include labor and other overheads? Are you comparing apples with apples? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've automated a lot of the finishing process. So um, when you're actually taking the parts off the printer, um, you're typically going, you know, the printer finishes the job, you're taking the build platform out of the printer, moving it over to the form wash machine, which is a simple, you know, take it out, put it in the other machine, hit the go button. That's going to automated wash, do an automated wash cycle on your part. Um, that's in the past, that was one of the probably the most labor intensive part of the post processing was actually um, getting the excess liquid resin off the part. But this automated washing cycle really uh, speeds that or doesn't speed it up. It takes about the same amount of time, but it takes all that human labor out of it um, because it's sitting there doing it automated in a machine instead of a human doing it. So that was one of the largest cost drivers of finishing SLA parts in the past. And we've uh, really reduced that with the automated washing. Um, once the wash is done, though, uh, you'll let the parts dry and then uh, remove them from the build platform, um, which typically goes pretty smoothly. The parts are on a, on a raft uh, with a beveled edge around it, so it's easy to get a tool under and get them off. And then you can uh, cure them in the form cure, which is another automated cycle. And then once that's uh, all complete, you're going to remove the part from its supports. That's now the most labor intensive part of the process. But as long as once you get you once you get like really familiar with using the SLA printer, uh, you start really kind of being able to feel like how low a density and what how small of support size you can use on these parts. And once you get that really reduced down to where you have as few supports as possible and as small supports as possible, they uh, they pop off the platform or they pop off the part really cleanly. So that leaves you um, with a really kind of not very time consuming part. I think as newer users probably experience a lot more post-processing frustration and time because they haven't really um, gotten to where they can push the limits of the printer yet. But after I'd say 10, 20 prints, you get really familiar with it. Awesome. Well, I think we are running a bit over time. Um, so thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us today and presenting. Really enjoyed it. Um, you're welcome. You I see will... one from Brent. Uh, Brent, I use it just a off-the-shelf silicone or off-the-shelf degassing chamber for uh, degassing the silicone. It, they're they're actually really inexpensive. Under a hundred bucks, you get the pump and the chamber and everything. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. We're gonna go into the next presentation from Intopology now. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank everyone you. for watching.